go. For the first piece of our stratospheric balloon puzzle, we wanted to explore how we would track and recover it. It might seem a little backwards to be thinking about how to get the thing back when we haven't even built it yet, but to get any of the data or video footage off of the equipment, we need to retrieve it. That means we need to be able to track and find it when it comes down. As part of the payload, we're going to include a phone with GPS tra tracking capabilities. We'll set it up to report its position every so often, and then we can track it using a service like Acu AccuTracking.com or InstaMapper.com. For this episode, we will show you a little bit about how GPS works. Let's start with the basic idea. GPS consists of more than two dozen satellites in orbit, about 12,500 miles up. When someone with a GPS receiver wants to find out where they are, they ask the GPS satellites. The satellites, usually at least four of them, will tell the receiver how far they are from each. The satellite's position is known at any given time, so if you know how far you are from each of them, you can figure out where you are using a technique known as trilateration. Each distance from a satellite forms an imaginary sphere in space, with the satellite as the center. When you overlap enough of those spheres, you get a point that represents where you are on Earth. Since the satellites are in orbit thousands of miles above you, the receiver can't really send up a measuring tape to directly determine the distance between it and the satellite. The receiver can, however, look at the time needed for the satellite signals to reach it. Since light moves at a constant rate, if you knew how long a signal took to reach you, you can calculate distance. Now, as an aside, light does not move through all mediums at the same speed. The speed of light is typically given in a vacuum, where it doesn't have any matter to interact with and slow it down. Light moving through the atmosphere, or bouncing off skyscrapers in a big city, will slow it down. Or, more correctly, increase the time it takes to reach your receiver. That's why having a clear line of sight to the satellites is important. Less stuff for the signal to interact with on the way down. For the purposes of this video, however, we can assume that light moves at a known constant speed from the satellite to the receiver. Now, knowing the distance to a few satellites isn't enough. We want to know how to use that information to determine location. Because telling the tow truck driver that you're 13,189 miles from Navstar 43 isn't really useful for us humans. Right. GPS is designed to work with the curved surface of the Earth. So to simplify, simplify things here and show how this works, we'll use a flat, two-dimensional map and circles rather than spheres. The idea is the same, though. Let's say you are trying to navigate around Candyland, and you'd like to know where you are currently. Let's say there was a GPS satellite above Plumpy's spot on the board, and you knew from signals that you were 20,000 miles from it. Wow, I never realized Candyland was this big. Those shortcuts are really looking good now. With that distance, you can now draw a circle on the board. Basically, by only asking one satellite, all you know is how far, so far, is that you're on in that circle somewhere. Now, let's say we had a second satellite on the Lost in Lollipop Woods spot, and you knew from that satellite that you were about 16,000 miles from it. You could draw a second circle with the satellite in the center. Now you can start to narrow down where you are on the board, based on where the circles intersect. With two satellites and a two-dimensional board, there are two possible spots. If we get a signal from a third satellite, let's say over the Stuck in Molossus Swamp spot, and you knew that you were 13,000 miles from it, you could draw a third circle. And where the three thir circles intersect will tell you where you are. Excellent. I'm glad I'm past Lord Licorice. That guy just creeps me out. Um, yeah. Because the guy who's made out of candy canes or the little green goblin named Plumpy are totally normal, right? <clears throat> Shall we move along? Yes, let's. We've seen how we can determine where we are by using distances to known satellites using trilateration. And we've previously said that we could determine those distances indirectly by the time it took the signals to reach us. However, we kind of glossed over this last point, and we want to show you how that works in a more, little more detail. 
I thought the best way to illustrate this was to build our own satellite, but unfortunately I don't have a few million dollars lying around for construction, and all of my frequent flyer miles for Delta IV heavy lift rockets are used up, and... <coughs> um, yeah? I felt I owed it to our listeners to stop you before you used up all the words. For the record, there were no satellites constructed for this part of the experiment. We decide to simulate light moving from one point to another, but in slow motion. Really slow motion. For this part, we used the following ex equipment. Painter's tape, a tape measure, two pieces of doweling, two stopwatches, a calculator, and then some items that were not shown in this picture. Two folding chairs, clipboard and pen for recording the times, and Dad's car as well as one licensed driver, also not shown. First, we taped the pieces of doweling to the chairs, and then added some more tape to the top of the doweling, so it would stand out better. Then, we placed the two chairs on our street, one in front of our house, and one, with their permission, at our neighbor house, neighbor's house, three doors down. The idea here is that chair number one would be the satellite, and chair number two would be the receiver on the ground. The car, would represent the signal traveling at the speed of light from the satellite to the receiver. Now, my car doesn't really go at the speed of light, despite the fact that it's white. So, you, now, you know, now you see why this is a really, really slow motion demonstration of GPS. The signal from the GPS satellite is time stamped, which means the exact moment in time when it was generated and sent up is actually sent with the signal. When the receiver gets that signal, it compares this timestamp on the signal with its own internal clock. The difference between those two t is the time the signal took to travel from one to the other. Now, it's important that the satellite's clock and the receiver's clock are in sync with each other. Otherwise, you won't get a very good reading of the time it took for the signal to travel. We won't go into detail as to how GPS keeps those two clocks in sync with each other. For our experiment, we use stopwatches. Catherine would be with me in the car, and her stopwatch would represent the timestamp on the signal from the satellite. CJ, my wife, would be on the sidewalk with the other stopwatch, which would represent the synchronized clock in the receiver on Earth. We ended up making three official runs down the street to gather times, and between each one we would clear the times off the stopwatches and then resynchronize them. Dad would get up to a target speed of 20 miles per hour and drive past the first doweling. I would sight out the window and try to stop my stopwatch as soon as it lined up with some painter's tape we put on the window. The time on my stopwatch became the timestamp on the signal from the satellite. My job was to try to keep my speed constant as we drove down the street. My car doesn't have cruise control and has a manual transmission, so this was a little challenging. Mom was waiting by the second chair with her, chair with her stopwatch. When we passed the second doweling, and she saw the painter's tape on the window line up with the doweling, Mom would stop her stopwatch. The time on her stopwatch was the time when the signal arrived at the receiver. After each run, we would pull over and write down the times on both stopwatches. We'd then clear them and resynchronize them for the next run. Here are the times you've recorded. Those gave us these differences in seconds. Now, to figure out distance between the two chairs, we just need to multiply the time that the signal, in this case Dad's car, took to move between those two chairs. Dad's speedometer measures things in miles per hour. We are measuring things in seconds, though, and the distance between the two chairs was only a small fraction of a single mile. To make things a little easier, we converted 20 miles per hour to feet per second. To start, we multiply 20 miles per hour by the number of feet in a mile, 5,280. That gives us 100, get 105,600 feet per hour. Next, we divided the num by the number of seconds in an hour, and that gives us 29.3 feet per second. Going back to our data sheet then, we filled in our speed of 29.3 feet per second and multiplied them by our times to give us distance. We then averaged those together 
to get our calculated distance of 269 feet. To verify how well we did, we directly measured the distance between the two chairs using a measuring tape. We found the chairs were 250 feet apart, a difference of less than 10%. How could we become more accurate? Well, we had a few places that were error prone. First, you're driving. Hey! Take it easy! What I meant was, you had to keep the car moving at a constant speed from one point to the other. The only way you had to control our speed was by how far you were pushing the gas pedal down. That's fine when you're on the road going to work, but not when you're trying to determine distance like we were. Okay, fine. I'll give you that one. And even if you could maintain a constant speed, you were judging how fast we were going by using an analog speedometer. Trying to keep the gauge lined up with the 20 on the dial was another source of error. Finally, Mom and I introduced at errors when we, were trying, when we tried to stop the stopwatches the moment when the painter's tape on the window passed the doweling. An overall error of 10% is fine when you're measuring things that are only a couple hundred feet apart, but when you're 12,000 miles or more apart, being 10% off in the U.S. could mean you could be in a different state. Or at least a different city in Texas. Right. I still think it would have been cool to build our own satellite. Well, instead of building and launching your own satellite, save yourself the cost and just launch your car into space and time how long it takes to fall back to Earth. Then you could go along with, with it with your stopwatch and then when you um, land, I'll hit stop on my stopwatch. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Doesn't it though? You might even go faster than 20 miles per hour.